So just a quick intro before we kick off. Um, Alex and I are from different teams at the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. So we came together with some of our team members back in January um, of last year on a project basis to undertake the research that we're going to walk you through today. Um, so for those of you not familiar with the organisation, um, we are the largest bank in the Southern Hemisphere and we're listed on the ASX with around 16 million customers that we service. So I lead the bank's cybersecurity training and awareness function. Um, we have quite a small team of five and we service close to 40,000 employees. So pretty much everything that we do um, has to scale. Alex um, is joined me from the behavioral data science team at CBA. Um, so he brought an amazing skill set to our research um, and he has a background in operations engineering and behavioral research um, and was actually the author for one of the scales that we ended up using um, in our research. So looking at the problem space that we were trying to investigate in the research, um, it's one that many of you are probably quite familiar with. So our observations um, were that mass marketing type approaches to awareness just generally weren't correlating with um, a widespread improvement in performance at actually detecting cyber threats. Um, we'd also observe that um, just kind of providing the rules and then saying follow the rules to your employee base can be quite demotivating and it doesn't necessarily stick um, because human behaviour and decision making is obviously much more complex than just being told something and then being expected to apply it, particularly when you're dealing with um, potentially new and unfamiliar scenarios. Um, we'd also read a lot of research that said that um, the decisions and the actions that people take with respect to cybersecurity threats are heavily influenced by the way they perceive risk and how they see their own susceptibility to a threat. Um, and that isn't actually always commensurate to the real risk, which makes it quite hard to affect change um, from our educator standpoint if you really aren't dialed into those differences. So while we knew that the logical conclusion for all of this was that training should be personalised and should take into account demographics and individual risk profiles. We found it really hard when we we're doing our research to find examples of where that had been effectively done, particularly in an organisation as large as ours, um, and in a way that was um, scalable to tens of thousands of employees. So really what we, what in a nutshell we were wanting to do was test, first of all, um, an approach to segmentation for a large employee base on the basis of risk perception and risk taking measures. We also wanted to see if there were any other additional demographic indicators that for our particular staff base correlated with an accuracy um, in terms of detecting threats. Um, and we also wanted to look at, or finally we wanted to look at whether effectively targeting segments on the basis of risk perception could actually result in an improvement to threat detection performance. So looking at um, what could we use to segment uh, our stuff, we um, leveraged some of uh, the previous research that my previous team developed on the concept of um, risk perception and risk taking and how the combination allows us to segment um, essentially humans. And here we uh, basically looked at uh, key behaviors, top behaviors uh, that are relevant in the cyberspace. We distilled that into a set of five dimensions, so security, personal data, private privacy, negligence and cybercrime and then turn that into a set of scales. Um, so the scale that we ended up using uh, is called Cyber Dospert, and it allows us to segment people into four categories. So people who are relaxed about cybersecurity, people who are ignorant about cybersecurity, so they uh, see uh, no risk essentially, and they also take no risk uh, that to their best knowledge. Um, and also opportunistic people who see the risk and take the risk and finally, the anxious, the ones that see a lot of risk everywhere and don't take the risk. And um, if, um, if we apply this scale to different populations, we start seeing very interesting segments forming, especially cross-culturally, because different cultures seem to respond differently. And that was in line with a lot of previous research, but finally we had a scale and we could measure it. So we ran several representative samples in our previous research. 
on, for example, the U.S. population, and we see a typical risk aversion uh, relationship where you see less risk, you take more risk, and when you see more risk, you, see, you take it less. So that's a usual, let's say, Western culture type of relationship. So you don't engage in risk if you perceive it. Uh, the UK had a similar type of response uh, and similar type of segmentation, vari varying rates of uh, proportionate, um, uh, say, ignorant opportunistic segments. But however, uh, uh, looking at the Chinese representative sample, the relationship between risk perception and risk taking was inverse. So we observed a very interesting uh, difference culturally. So uh, the Chinese population representative, uh, representative sample tended to take more risk uh, based on the more risk they perceived, which was very interesting. So that that is very promising from a segmentation perspective because the scale is sensitive to nuances even in cultural differences. So if you move to the next uh, slide. So once we landed on the segmentation approach and decided to use the cyberdospert scale that um, Alex just spoke to, we were interested in looking at what we could find about interventions that were likely to work based on applying this kind of risk-taking and risk-perception lens to segmentation. So we performed a literature review and we pulled out some seminal papers, which we've listed here um, in case people are interested in following up and reading them themselves. Really though, um, what it boiled down to was us taking elements of other research and hypothesizing that if we could focus on those two quartiles where risk perception was low and aim to uplift that risk perception, people would be willing to spend longer assessing potential threats and that this in turn would actually improve their detection performance. Um, and I'm sure that anyone who runs a fishing simulation program here is really familiar if you do any kind of interviews or surveying of that subset of people who are consistently um, poor performers in fishing simulation, you'll often hear that refrain that, look, I'm just really time poor. So when emails arrive, I just want to action them and get on with my to-do list. So that was kind of the basis from which we approached the, the intervention design was that we'd roll it out um, and then watch to see if people who had low risk perception would improve their performance more than the general population. So looking at the timeline, we essentially designed what we call a longitudinal study. We started with profiling risk using the cyber dosper scale that we just explained earlier. And we were able to obtain individual staff profiles on a representative sample of staff, which we traced throughout the whole study. Um, that also allowed us to develop a profile of the risk across the organization because we were sampling um, all the functions uh, and a random sample of the whole organization. That gave us uh, a very complete picture of the whole um, uh, organizational structure. And um, by itself, it was already value adding because we could assess the risk perception risk taking at different business units, different teams, and uh, down to the individual level. Um, the next stage of that study was the threat detection assessment when we deployed the human as a security sensor test. It is a performance based test that uh, is meant to both understand people's ability to identify risks, which we will explain in more detail in the next slide and also ask them about their confidence and their reasoning. So they had a qualitative dimension to it. So they will be able to tell us what they considered, even though this was a relatively large scale uh, study. And in parallel, we run a uh, fishing simulation, the one that we generally do. So we deployed it to the same cohort. And that allowed us to understand a lot of um, the drivers of performance. So what makes some people better than others? Uh, we had a lot of the metadata that the organization usually has on, on employees. And um, again, that allowed us to have performance and uh, understanding of that performance considering confidence based segment down to the individual level. That combined the profile risk allowed us to start designing the interventions, which was the third stage. So we designed educational animations. Uh, after the behavioral interventions wa was deployed, after the treatment was deployed, we um, redeployed the human as a cybersecurity sensor test, which allowed us to measure their performance after the intervention. 
we run again the phishing simulation on the same cohort. And for context, people are not aware that they're being targeted for phishing simulation, as usually. And um, we observed a 4% uplift, significant uplift across uh, segments on average, which in our world is quite significant. And finally, this whole cycle allowed us to develop several prototypes on how to best engage with, uh, with uh, our staff on this matter, how to best drive behavioral change. And um, those results then allow us to set up benchmarks, build uh, a measurement system around targeted interventions, evidence behind our interventions, so impact. And um, it is traceable because we trace how people become better over their previous selves rather than general groups, group, because often it just takes one. So we were very interested in having that uh, insight down to the individual employee. And finally, performance monitoring, because this type of approaches can be easily deployed uh, again and again, obviously at time cost, but uh, with relative um, uh, sparse sampling over the year, it would allow us to have a really good insight, especially if you combine that with other means like fishing simulation. And over the next slides, uh, we will explain in more detail every single step of this journey. Thanks, Alex. Um, so I mentioned before some of the seminal papers that we anchored our thinking on. And one of those was a paper called You Are Probably Not the Weakest Link um, by Hartfield, Lucas and Gann. And basically within that paper, they'd actually developed a method for testing threat detection performance using something called human as a security sensor. Um, the purpose of their paper was to try and look at um, whether you could predict susceptibility to semantic social engineering attacks. But what we did was use the methodology, um, though we developed our own threat and non-threat exhibits so that they were closer to the kind of benign or malicious attack vectors that our employees were likely to come across. So the attack types that we used, we mapped to the MITRE framework. Um, and so we had a combination in there of um, phishing, of course, which um, supplemented the separate phishing simulation, but we also used um, masquerading user execution and valid accounts in the form of um, malicious installers. We also simulated um, a rogue Wi-Fi access point um, and put in there as well a couple, a couple more different kinds of attack types. So we used a survey tool um, and the approach was basically to test with a binary attack, non-attack choice that the participant had to make. Um, then they had to give their confidence um, in their answer and that was um, mapped on a scale. And then we also put in a free text form so that we could drill down and do some analysis, basically to, um, to enable us to do some topic modeling later down the line and to try and follow people's logic to see if that kind of logic was sound when they were um, determining whether or not something was an attack or whether it was benign. So we used the same test um, before and after the intervention. The key difference being that the second time around, um, participants received feedback um, on how they performed um, after each exhibit. So they got that kind of just-in-time learning um, at the end of um, each like selection of attack or non-attack. So in terms of um, the intervention that we designed, we went for a short series of animated videos that we developed in-house um, that participants watched between taking the first and the second tests. So you remember from above the point that we were trying to, um, to get to was basically to elevate risk perception where it was low for participants, which was the relaxed and the ignorant or naive subtypes. So the video series basically showed um, a member of a ransomware crew that was trying to find their way um, into our network. And it followed a series of escalating attempts to get a foothold um, on the network and then to escalate privileges. So it was designed to um, really show how an employee can either help um, to stop an attack or actually, um, you know, the counterpoint of that to actually help facilitate an attack um, through their actions and basically how the decisions that we make um, and the actions that we take every day can be um, the point of weakness or conversely the um, you know the point of strength the point of stopping an attack 
So um, Alex will talk you through some of the cool things we found about demographics and performance. Um, and then I'll come back and talk you through um, what we discovered in terms of our hypothesis on the risk subtypes of the intervention. So looking at the performance drivers, and uh, this is without taking their segment into account, so something that will be generalized. And uh, some insights that we could scale up uh, just by knowing the organizational metadata we often um, uh, will, uh, or we observed and we, we should expect that um, people who have higher educational time and uh, will perform better in threat detection and that turns out to be truth. Equally, experience uh, in the cyber domain, so the time that they spend online is equally predictive of good performance, also equally logical and expected but we actually have uh, significantly statistical, significant statistical results to back that up. Uh, finally, things that drive worse performance uh, are long tenure, and that also helps us to understand who to approach, even if you don't know any of their, let's say, risk taking and risk perception measurements, and how to approach them potentially. And uh, age as well is predictive of worse performance, so the older people are, the worse they tend to perform in more recent uh, types of attacks and more innovative types of, types of attacks. And finally, another great flag was uh, whether they were victims of a previous scam or not. So that was a very big tell. And um, finally, we saw that uh, performance uh, is highly dependent on the job type, so it's not homogeneous. Again, backing up this hypothesis that we should not use a one-size-fits-all approach, we should segment. And uh, even if you know nothing on the risk perception, risk-taking side of each individual, we still know their job and their job functions. So that gives us a lot of things that we could work with, um, even if we don't, don't deploy a targeted study like this. So, on the next slide, we will dive into something very interesting on the uh, framing of cybersecurity. So, there is a common um, trend, and uh, luckily it's getting outdated, but the trend is about uh, scaring people off uh, in the space of security. So, you use fear as, tool, as a tool to make people um, perform better in this space. And um, we wanted to test that hypothesis. So in one of the cycles, um, the initial cycle of the human as a cybersecurity sensor, we deployed several treatments across our uh, sample. And um, some people will get a ne neutrally framed brief in the beginning that had no reference of how good or bad people are doing this or whether how much it costs or how much it benefits the organization. Then it had a positive frame where, the, where people were essentially praised for their ability to perform in this space and how much that benefits the organization. And a negative frame where people were briefed before their test uh, on how people are terrible on, on performing in this task, how it is important for them to be vigilant because naturally they will be bad about it and it costs, costs the organization, so we used fear there. And interestingly enough, if you know nothing about the segments itself, so whether they're anxious, ignorant, opportunistic, or relaxed, on a general term, we have a statistically worse performance for people who receive negative treatment, all else being equal, and equal also random allocation. So we neutralize all the other individual differences in this type of treatment attribution. And uh, people who received neutral or positive treatments performed significantly better, statistically significantly better. Um, considering the weighted versus unweighted scores, so um, just to explain more in the nuance of the value of the weighted score, if you take people's confidence in their response into account, you can uh, moderate their lucky guesses. So if someone is not confident at all, or let's say they say, I'm not confident at all, I, I rate zero on my confidence, and I still get a right answer. Zero will neutralize that answer, so my confidence will neutralize my answer. So my lucky guess is neutralized, and my weighting will show a result of zero, even though I performed well. So that will uh, highlight uh, what we call actual skills. So people who know what they're doing, plus they respond with very high degree of confidence, get the full points. 
versus people who made a lucky guess, 50-50, flip a coin, they will not get um, the point. And that gives us a much better insight into actual skill in performing the, this task. And equally traditionally, we use the original score without any weighting to just understand in general whether people have an intuition around this space that would warrant their performance. And in fact, we see very um, like, uh, significant differences across the board. But in terms of negative and positive treatment, this uh, relationship between positive and negative treatment con is consistent both in the weighted, skill-based, and um, the unweighted performance score. Diving into the segments, we, interestingly enough, observed that there is one segment that clearly benefits from negative frame. And that negative frame is best um, performing on the, uh, on the relaxed segment. So people who are not uh, very conscious about the risk they are facing the negative frame tends to wake them up, but luckily for us, that segment is very small relatively to the rest. So very, there are relatively few people, in our organization at least, that uh, will be classified as relaxed. All the rest, except for the ignorant segment, uh, show this type of um, response to negativity with a worse performance comparatively to the um, uh, positive framing or the neutral framing. So. If you don't know nothing about uh, your segments and who you are dealing with, just try to frame it positively when you design your communications around uh, people's cybersecurity behavior or any call-outs for them to perform better. Praise them and that will generally lead to better results, except for people who are very relaxed about the situation, they might benefit from a, a slight negative push in that direction. But again, one size does not fit all. And over the next slide, we will dive in other considerations that we had. Thanks, Alex. So coming back to um, our hypothesis then that segmenting based on risk types would improve detection and whether or not that was correct and whether or not we had our intervention dialed in enough. So basically we found that across the board, we saw an increase in detection performance, which supports existing research that recency of training is an important factor um, when you're looking at actual um, performance with relation to cybersecurity threat detection. But what we were trying to do was influence performance based on risk perception. And when it came to that, we were partially right. So we were anticipating that we'd see the greatest improvement in the two subtypes with low risk perception which were relaxed and ignorant and naive. And while we saw the greatest improvement in um, the relaxed subtype, which is the low risk perception and high risk taking, actually the other significant improvement in performance came from the opportunistic subtype, which is high risk perception and high risk taking. So our theory here was that what our intervention did was basically help that subset feel the consequences of high risk taking approach and the benefit to be derived from tampering that may have had the same effect that we were after of adjusting the motivation to expend mental energy in unpicking whether something was likely to be an attack or not. So in terms of what we can glean from this um, with regards to how to trailer, tailor training by risk type. So obviously the framing is actually really important as Alex has just covered. So depending on who you're talking to and how they respond to risk, they're more likely to change behavior if you can emphasize the risk of negative consequences for certain subtypes. And on the flip side, if you can focus on the power of positive change and the greater good for other subtypes. But what we walked away with was obviously the fact that we really wanna do some more research in terms of understanding, not just how we pull that risk perception lever, but actually like how we influence the risk taking as well, because it seems like we might've accidentally done that through the course of our experiment. So we're coming to the wrap now. And in terms of what you can actually take away from today, first, I think the most important thing is we need to move away from trying to target interventions based on an organisational structure towards something that's actually more meaningful um, for the employee and that takes into account risk perception and risk taking, as well as some other demographics if you have that material as well. Second, you obviously need multiple versions of your training that are framed for the audience that you're targeting. Basically, you wanna be speaking your employee's love language. 
whether that's bad consequences that they feel or personal empowerment to affect good outcomes, whichever is going to be the most effective. And when you don't have this segmentation in place, always err on the side of positive framing because negative framing used with the wrong audience, we've shown has a detrimental impact on the way that people actually perform. Third, fourth and fifth, um, I think you want to have a growth mindset in your program. So build, experiment, learn um, and then rebuild. And we'd obviously love to hear from you as you do so that we can keep sharing, I think, what we find out. I think experimenting in this area is um, really, really important. Um, and the body of research, I think, in terms of actually applying it in organisations is relatively slim. So the more I think that we can try and test these out in the real world scenario where you've got large employee bases like we do, um, I think the greater the learning can be can be for everyone and the more that we can kind of move towards something that is um, to greater effect. So to wrap this up in terms of what is, let's say a high level um, discussion and then be a bit more in-depth um, and more philosophical as well. We kicked off this with the motivation of trying to understand whether people are actually the weakest link in the whole chain and what we saw is that people are actually exceptional at doing things that machines often will fail. So automated systems, automated detection systems, um, they are great at reading uh, metadata, high volume uh, information uh, and other types of anomalies of otherwise known situations. But humans are great in understanding things that feel odd and are potentially new and discern between things that are out of place. So when we take this approach of a human as a sensor and bring the human into the system, back into the system. We are enabling a much better human machine teaming so the organization becomes stronger and more resilient to attacks because the uh, human factor element is working in favor of the system and the system is supporting the human factor. Um, finally, we have the ability to identify new threats and uh, other anomalies that uh, might be invisible. So the machines often will work with things that are known they will operate in systems of stability and they will highlight any things that fall out of place. And they might be perfectly normal, but uh, they might be just a slightly eccentric client. They might be a slightly eccentric request, but they might be normal. Otherwise, humans uh, try, uh, are actually much better at uh, detecting um, whether it's actually a true anomaly or not. And finally, um, this allows us the identification of early hot, uh, let's say, early hotspots or potential problems before they become a problem. Because uh, when we map risk across the organization, we are left with a very interesting picture down to, down to the employee level on where we might be emphasizing our interventions more, deploying more training, working with those people or potentially their role justifies um, them being a hotspot. Imagine uh, highly innovative teams, people who are disruptive by their nature. They might look like uh, riskier uh, comparatively and they might uh, look more reckless than others, for example, comparatively. But again, sometimes their function might justify their profiles and equally other functions might not justify that type of profile so we could work with them before that becomes an actual problem or a breach or a threat that realizes. And finally, like we don't want to make everyone anxious in this space. We want them to still perform their tasks. We want them to be operationally nimble, flexible, agile. Um, if security becomes a fear and if it starts driving increased levels of anxiety, that is highly detrimental to the organization. So it's really, really important to manage that level of anxiety and bring it to a healthy level, still maintaining a zero risk appetite, but be uh, realistic about it and be practical about it so people can perform their duties and uh, serve the customer.